today we have a special session. We will be discussing about gender equality policies and challenges. For this purpose, we have a special guest. We are with the leading academics. We want to thank to the economics and business faculty of the Autonomous Gabriel Rene Moreno in Bolivia for promoting this program. And we also appreciate the broadcast from Canal 11 Television Universitaria, Channel 11 University Television. We always remember that the main purpose of uh, this program is to discuss economic topics, but also social problems that affect to society as also some trends in business. Before starting our interview, I want to introduce our international guests. Here we have to Dr. Uh, Paula England. She has a PhD in sociology and a master of art in social sciences in University of Chicago. She also uh, is bachelor of art in sociology and psychology in Whitman College. Her areas of research and interests are related to changing family patterns, uh, care work, sexual behavior, contraception, gender and labor markets. She also uh, has interest in interdisciplinary integration and now she is the Dean of Social Science in New York University, Abu Dhabi. We also have uh, to Dr. Martin Montero, uh, Dr. Montero, he has a PhD in economics from West Virginia University. His research interests are based on macroeconomic issues in developing economies. Dr. Paula, Dr. Martin, it's really an honor to be with you in this conversation. Likewise. Okay, uh, given that said, uh, gender equality is one, is one target and indicator of uh, sustainable development goal. Uh, So-called SDGs, gender equality has a cultural and economic aspect. Women have made advances in education, labor and political representation, but inequality is still pervasive. In this session, we will be uh, discussing about gender equality policies and changes. Uh, first of all, we want to introduce uh, with some background, especially, for example, what is the role of culture in gender equality? Dr. Paula? Yeah, I think there is a big role uh, of culture. Um, you know, if you think about the kinds of gender inequalities, we often talk about women being employed less than men, uh, women earning less than men in terms of wages, uh, women not being in certain occupations very often. All of these things, they have multiple causes, but some of them are cultural in the sense that um, people learn in their families, you know, in their churches, in their neighborhoods, among their friends, certain values and ideas about, you know, how girls should be different than boys, you know, what's appropriate for women. Um, there are very strong beliefs that child rearing should be done mostly by women. And so women often do that work, but it, it of course, has an effect on their ability to uh, be employed compared to a situation where either men and women shared it, say in a marriage, or the state took on more of a role in terms of um, uh, child care. So cultural ideas about who should do child rearing constrain women's careers. Cultural ideas about which jobs are appropriate for men and women um, both affect what people want and think is possible and think is meaningful for someone of their gender or something they could identify with. Um, and so that affects occupational sex segregation um, and how much, 
how continuously you're employed and what jobs you're in, of course, affects your earnings. So those are all ways in which, and there may be ideas about, there are ideas about that leaders should be men and that uh, you know, masculinity is necessary for leadership roles. Um, so in all those ways, culture has a strong effect on gender inequality, but it also means that changing culture, although that's hard to do, can help with changes in gender inequality. Given this importance of the role of culture in gender equality, uh, now we have a second question. And uh, this is really important because uh, gender equality is considered uh, an objective, a target in sustainable development goals. So why do uh, we need to keep track of gender equality and why is uh, it respective importance? Why is it important in other terms? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question because I think, you know, fundamentally the reason gender inequality or gender equality is an important goal is just simple justice, right? That when women are seen to be inferior to men, when they're not seen as appropriate to have power, um, when both men and women are constrained by ideas about what roles they can be in when they're discriminated against, this makes the lives of women more difficult. Um, and one way that's true is even in their marriages, if women have less economic opportunity, their bargaining power in their marriages may be less. Um, their ability to leave a marriage in which they're a victim of violence is less. Um, or just the ability of men and women to do what they want to do is constrained by discrimination and by these kind of cultural ideas. And so I think the main reason gender equality is important is a matter of simple human justice. The same way we might say that um, racial discrimination is wrong just as a matter of simple justice. Um, now, it's interesting that there are different reasons for favoring gender equality. And I think um, in the UN and in the World Bank and you know, IMF and organizations like this recently, there has been a lot of research showing that when, for example, you educate women, um, child mortality goes down. You know, when you educate women, lots of other good things happen in communities. So yes, it's important just for the simple justice that women can have greater opportunities that they didn't have before, but it also helps children, it helps communities, it helps with economic development um, if you're you know, educating the whole population instead of half of it. Um, and I think those are some of the reasons that um, that the UN has made it one of their development goals. Given, given this principle, for example, you mentioned uh, human justice, you have to mention, uh, we, we can infer combating again discrimination or to get uh, better opportunities. So uh, there is a fact that, uh, for example, uh, the international evidence uh, reflects that on average, women earn less than men. And this is not an assumption. What are some of these causes? Why is this happening? Yeah. And, you know, I have to be honest that I have studied this more in the Western, you know, kind of rich country context um, than I have, although I know some of the literature for example, in Latin America, and some of the same principles hold. Um, so, you know, I mentioned when we were talking about culture that there's often an assumption, say, in married couples that um, if someone's going to stay home and take care of children, it's the woman. So that leads women to have less continuous employment than men. So then when women are 
employed, they probably have fewer years of experience than their same male counterpart. Economists sometimes call this human capital, right? Because they think we're usually learning as we're doing the job, so we're increasing our human capital. Or you could just call it seniority or something, but employers pay by seniority. So anything that makes women less continuously employed creates a gender gap in pay if men are more continuously employed. And in, in for example, the US, um, it used to be maybe that, I don't know, something like 40 or 50% of the sex gap in pay was explained by an experience gap. Then women started being employed more continuously. So the experience gap went down and that is part of why the gender gap in pay has gotten smaller over the decades. Um, another really big factor is occupational sex segregation. And, and by that, I just simply mean women and men tend to be in different occupations, right? So, you know, we can think of occupations like childcare workers and uh, teachers of small children that are mostly women some kind of administrative secretarial work, some kinds of teaching that are mostly women, other jobs, both high level and low level that are predominantly male, right? Laborers, certain kinds of farm work, but also managers and you know accountants and other kinds of professionals. Um, and the segregation tends to be such that women are in the lower paying jobs. So what jobs women and men are in is one determinant of the sex gap in pay. And sometimes people think we should only be interested in the sex gap in pay comparing men and women in the same job. But we have to realize that both culture affecting the supply side of who applies for what jobs and discrimination on the demand side of labor market itself affected by culture um, are both factors in why we have occupational sex segregation. And that segregation is one of the main causes of the sex gap in pay also. Um, so the experience gap and the segregation are really the two most fundamental causes. And they both have, you know, economists often argue about the supply side versus the demand side. And I think both sides are relevant here. Employers discriminate and people are socialized by culture and that affects their different um, aspirations and what jobs they seek out and how continuously they're employed. So uh, in these terms, uh, we, can, we can say that we have, uh, for example, you mentioned employer discrimination and culture. So we have a kind of uh, bias. We have bias, some bias here in the decision. Yeah, um, yeah, so bias, you know, bias is just, you know, just in, in a way is another word to talk about how we may not see things as they really are. And, you know, when we see a woman doing something, we may think she's less skilled, even if she is equally skilled to a man. Um, and that may affect who someone decides to hire, um, who someone decides to promote. Um, and the bias can be a group biased against themselves too, in the sense that they have bought into the cultural ideas too, that, oh, well, I, I, I probably wouldn't be appropriate for management, um, you know, uh, because I'm a woman. And so again, these things can always be on, on the employer side, but also on the employee side sometimes. Great. In the last year, or perhaps in the last decades, uh, what is the international evidence about trends in gender equality in terms of employment, educational attainment, or perhaps uh, political representation? Um, perhaps uh, we have uh, the pandemic. Well, the pandemic has not already finished, but 
uh, pandemic also affect these trends? What, what are yeah. the international evidence? Yeah, so um, the, you know, in general, so I didn't mention one thing about education, you know, as you know, probably one of the things where there's really been progress all over the world is, you know, it used to be true that in almost every country, men got more education than women. Today, there are many countries in which women are getting more education than men. Um, and um, there are still some countries in which it's lower for women, uh, but it's a revert thing in some countries and it's, you know, the gap's closing. So there the trend pretty much all over the world has been towards women converging towards men and how much education they get and sometimes even passing them. Um, in terms of the segregation of jobs, um, you know, how sex typed are the jobs and how much are women more likely to be starting to go into what in the past were seen as male jobs, like being doctors or being carpenters or being managers, um, you know, the, the job I'm in of being a dean, uh, you know, probably 30 years ago, you wouldn't have seen as many women deans as you might see now. So um, the trend has been towards less occupational segregation and women moving into more form jobs that formerly were just kind of only reserved for men. Um, and that trend is really happening, I think all over the world, you know, it's at different places in terms of progress in different places, but um, it's really quite, quite a common trend. And there has been a trend towards then the sex gap in pay diminishing. Now, all of these things have moved toward equality, but not to equality. Um, and in a number of uh, Western countries, I'll call them, say the US and Europe, um, probably Canada too, um, there has been kind of a, a slowdown or stalling of change towards gender equality in the last, say, 20 years ago. So for example, in the United States, women's employment went up steadily. And then since about the late 90s or 2000, the proportion of women employed has been pretty constant. Um, the sex gap in pay is still declining but it's declining much more slowly than it was before. And at least on the employment side, you can see some of these same trends in Europe. And you see um, that the countries that were slowest to have an increase in women's employment, they may still be increasing, but other countries have kind of you know, plateaued, but they plateau at a level that's way below equality. That is, you know, they still, a lot more men employed than women. So this, this fact about this kind of slowdown of the progress, I don't know if this is true in developing countries or not, and I'd really like to see research on that. Maybe you can get some experts on that on your show sometime that know much more than I do. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the causes of the slowdown are, but it does seem to be happening in a number of different areas. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, sometimes comparisons are some tedious. Uh, and perhaps uh, we want to compare in uh, what kind of countries we can mention that are the best example of gender equality and perhaps uh, which are their characteristics? Well, um... People often point to the Scandinavian countries as the most gender egalitarian. And there are a number of ways in which that's true. Um, in the Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, you know, some of the other countries around there, um, women's employment rates are quite high. 
Um, they um, also, we haven't talked about poverty, but you know, one of the implic since many women become single mothers through various things, they had a child on their own uh, or broke up with the father or whatever. Um, so we have many single women and when women are earning less than men, um, then, um, then more women are in poverty because women are very concentrated in you know, extremely low paying jobs. Um, so um, in Scandinavia, there is almost no effect of being a woman on being in poverty. And there's almost no effect of being a single mother on being in, po in, being in poverty. That is, they have enough of a social safety net of uh, various kinds of income, uh, you know, social welfare programs that um, essentially create a floor such that single mothers are almost never in poverty. That's not true in you know, most countries. Um, there's also uh, more women in politics uh, in Scandinavia than in some other places. Um, some of the things, and, and one of the, I know you're interested in policies. One of the policies that I think is most important for gender equality, especially for more working class women, uh, you know, that are not highly educated and have access to professional jobs, is does the state provide or at least pay for childcare from a pretty early age for children? So you could think of this as do we socialize the rearing of children? You know, in one sense, almost all countries have decided to socialize education. It's paid for by the state for the most part. It's thought of as creating public goods and, um, you know, for reasons both of distribution and public goods, it's thought that's appropriate. Well, we could extend the same, the same thing to childcare. And childcare, whether the state provides it or pays for it, doesn't make that much difference for a highly paid professional woman because she can afford good childcare and still stay employed. But if you are making an extremely low wage, you may be at a wage level and an income level such that half of what you could earn goes away from having to pay for the childcare. And so in a sense, you can't afford to be employed. Um, and um, the Scandinavian countries have very good systems of childcare. And actually the French also do where um, it's available from a very young age for kids and maybe people have to pay for it, but it's pretty minimal. So it's not such a barrier for someone who's, you know, doesn't have a high income. And that will make a really big difference on how, what percent of working class women are employed, um, which will then, you know, help them with employment continuity leads to higher wages later and all those sorts of things. So I think there's a number of ways in which the Scandinavian countries are more egalitarian. Now, they also have a higher percent of women working part-time than is true in the US. They kind of make it very easy for women to move down to part-time jobs at the same hourly pay. Of course, you earn less if you're only working half time and or there's jobs that are like two thirds time and a very high number of women do that. And in the US, because that option isn't there, and if you go to part-time, your pay will be so much lower, it sort of pushes women more to an all or nothing thing. You know, you're either a stay-at-home mom or you work 40 hours a week. Um, and so in that sense, it's a little less egalitarian in that the system's kind of encouraging um, part-time work by women. Now, at the same time, they kind of believe men should be participating more in the child rearing 
And so sometimes they have these policies in Scandinavian countries that the woman gets a certain amount of, uh, well, a parent of either sex gets a certain amount of leave after the baby's born paid for by the state off from their job and, and the employer has to hold the job for them. But they require, well, there, there's a certain number of weeks that if the woman's already taken that, the rest of the time that's available to the couple, they lose it if the other partner doesn't take it. And so they're trying to encourage men to be more primary childcare uh, givers. I mean, they still have much higher take up by women, but they, they've made some progress on that. So that's another thing that they do that's very egalitarian. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, please, uh, would you give us a general comment or perhaps you want to make uh, any question about this uh, first background? Sure. Thanks, uh, Professor England, for, for your explanations. And, um, I want to highlight what you said. In many countries, now the access to education is either 50-50 or in some cases, the proportion of women is even higher. Um, not only developed countries, but also developing. For instance, that's the case in, in Lebanon. And then at the very beginning, you were talking about the effect of culture in gender equality. So I'm bringing all these points together because it seems to me that at some point, this gender inequality is based on personal and individual choices. True, they might be guided by culture, right? But at the end, it's, it's a, a person who decides in which field to work, or it's a person who decides whether to go to university or not, or, um, you know, um, whether to have uh, kids or not. Um, so my question would be, and this is as an introduction to the second part, my question would be whether there should be policies taken by the government or it should just be the private sector who eventually come up with a solution for this um, gender inequality. Because if these are personal options, the question would be whether we allow the government to force us and do something else. Yeah. Sound like a good economist, always worried about uh, too much government intervention. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, let me, let me give you sort of my take on that. Uh, you know, the whole business about choice is very tricky. You know, I don't know if either of you have heard this it's, it's kind of an old joke, but people sometimes say um, economics is all about how people make choices and sociology is all about how they have no choices to make. Um, and that's a little bit of a caricatured thing about how, you know, sometimes arguments between sociologists and economists. Um, but I actually think both disciplines are right in a sense that Yes, these things are matters of choice to some extent. And as you say, choice, understanding that what it is I choose to do is deeply affected by my cultural milieu. Um, but we could still call that choice. Um, but there are also constraints. And, you know, obvious ones are like, uh, when women encounter, you know, some young woman is very good at carpentry and she wants to be a carpenter and she goes to the places where they're building houses, but they won't hire her. You know, maybe they'll sexually harass her, but they won't hire her or they'll hire her and then sexually harass her so badly that she feels she has to quit. So, you know, that's a constraint she faces. And so if five years later, she's not a carpenter, well, it wasn't all about choice. Now, for many women, it is a choice. They would never think of doing that. Or similarly, a man would never think of going into a traditionally female job like nursing, say. Um, so when, when there's clear employer discrimination, then that's not choice by the employee. Um, there's other more subtle kinds of choice, uh, excuse me, of constraints. So think about constraints in marriage markets. 
Um, if I'm a young woman and I want to uh, have a career and I want to have a family and I'd like to have a husband who will do half of the household work and childcare, how likely am I to find that man? Not very likely because there aren't very many such many ar men around. There are some. Um, and that's a constraint on me if I'm that young woman with that set of desires. So it may be that the fact that she gets in a marriage with someone more traditional isn't exactly a choice. I mean, it's a choice, as economists always talk about, it's a choice under constraints, right? Um, of the men available to her, she picked this one, but she would have really liked an option where a person was more egalitarian. And I think, those kind of constraints in personal situations are very real for women and for men. I mean, a similar constraint would be a man who would like to not have to take sole responsibility for, for being the breadwinner, uh, being the person making the earnings. You know, he may be constrained in his ability to find women that are open to taking some of that on. So I think things are partly constraints and they're partly choices and you know both of those are going on. Now you asked about should we instead of the public sector think of the private sector as having solutions? Um, I think there are many things private sector can do. I mean, for example, private sector can realize well, um, uh, we will, some of these women are very talented, but if we don't provide childcare or create some amount of flexibility, we're gonna lose these women. And maybe for profit seeking reasons, they may do things that are actually helpful for gender equality. Um, you know, there's a theory in economics that says eventually as discrimination should erode in competitive markets because if people are paying more than they need to for men who are incompetent, then it's some employer that comes and hires the smart women instead, uh, you know, and there's a little arbitrage going on and, and uh, right? And I think that markets do work that way sometimes, but there's some things only the state can do, I think. And, you know, like in economics, they say that only the state can do re redistribution and public goods provision. Um, and I think that that's um, that childcare really falls in that camp. That um, the benefits of publicly provided childcare are very great, but they also have real distributional um, consequences between men and women. Um, and it kind of takes it takes the state to provide childcare to people that can't afford it, given how little they they um, earn. So those are some examples. So I think public and private sector we need involved. Dr. Uh, England, Dr. Martin, uh, the time for this interview was really very short. We have many further questions, but uh, the time is a little, it's, it's up. So uh, we will uh, finish our conversation. In your own experience and research, you have a study and suggested uh, some policies regarding gender equality. So uh, would you kindly mention what you consider most important and perhaps uh, what are the main challenges for achieving uh, gender equality? Yeah, I mean, one I already mentioned, I think public provision of childcare for younger children um, is, is really important, especially for the employment of working class women um, and has helpful effects on kids too. I think that anti-discrimination laws that are enforced are helpful. Um, I worked for a long time on the issue called comparable worth. And the idea is that we usually think of discrimination as either sex effects, will they hire me into a certain job? or sex effects, how much will they pay me compared to the other person in my same job? 
But there's a third type of uh, bias or discrimination that employers can engage in, which is that jobs that are already traditionally female, they pay less to than the skill demands of the jobs so that very well-skilled female dominated jobs pay less than say the same educational requirement job of a, of a male job. It's two different jobs, but they require the same amount of education. The women's job tends to systematically pay less. And that's a, a kind of third form of setting the pay level in a whole job lower because of the sex composition of who tends to be in it. And it's a form of discrimination that some countries have laws against. And I think that's an important thing um, too. So those would be some of the policies I would think about. Okay, uh, Dr. Martiro, Dr. Martin, please, you have any final comment, any uh, aspect that you want to highlight or perhaps uh, final questions? No, no, I think I think that we ran out of time and uh, Professor England has been very kind in uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, we really appreciate that. So I don't want to take out more of, from your time. I do have many other <laughs> questions, but uh, <laughs> I will just have to leave it till some other time. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful to talk with uh, both of you and uh, good luck with uh, your other guests on your show. And uh, yes, yeah, send the information to me and I will tweet it out. Dr. England, Dr. Martin, uh, we really appreciate all of your comment and significant contribution. Please, uh, we kindly invite you for another conversation again for a, a near future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Professor England. This was thank our you. main conversation in this session discussing some concerns about gender equality policies and challenges. Now we go to our institutional announcement and we'll continue with our program.